newsflash. Just because a reaction is thermodynamically favorable and has negative free energy doesn't mean it will instantly run. Let's look at a classic chemical reaction that demonstrates this fact. Hydrogen gas and oxygen gas can make liquid water. This reaction is called a combustion reaction, where we are burning the hydrogen with oxygen. We also call this a synthesis reaction where we make a compound from the elements. The balanced chemical equation is shown on the slide. The reaction is one of the most powerful energy producing explosive reactions we have in chemistry. The delta G for the reaction is very negative, telling us that this reaction wants to run to the final state and produce water in the worst way. The problem is, if we have oxygen gas and hydrogen gas together in a balloon, my oxygen hydrogen balloon won't react to form water. It will just float around happy as a clam. A reaction, though thermodynamically favored, is obviously not enough to drive this reaction to completion or even initiate it. There are two ways to get this reaction to go. We can either light the balloon with a candle or we could somehow put a piece of platinum catalyst in the balloon. Both actions will give us explosive results. So what's going on? Well, reactions have to climb what we call an energy barrier or activation energy between the reactants and products. It's this energy barrier that moderates the speed or rate of the reaction and consequently the back reaction as well. Looking at the molecular form of the reactants, diatomic single bonded hydrogen and double bonded oxygen gases, we see that we must somehow break the relatively strong hydrogen and oxygen bonds. This breaking of bonds requires energy. After the bonds break, the oxygen and hydrogen atoms can form stronger and more stable oxygen-hydrogen bonds in the synthesis of water. Overall, there is a release of energy in this bond-making step because we created a more stable, low-energy form of the oxygen-hydrogen atoms called water. A spark of energy provided by a candle helps the reaction get over the barrier and the release of energy feeds other reactions helping them over the barrier and in this case a cascade of reactions occur that can produce an explosion and the final state water. So how about the addition of a piece of platinum, a catalyst? Well what happens is that we now have provided the reaction an alternative path one that has a much lower energy barrier that's easier for the reaction to get over. Catalysts lower the activation barrier in reactions. Again, as soon as one molecule of water forms, there will be more than enough energy emitted to spark the other reactions, sending them over the barrier. The actual reaction path and method of how a reaction runs is called a mechanism. The area of study which includes measuring the speed or rates of reactions and figuring out the mechanisms is part of chemistry that we call kinetics. The lower the barrier between reactants and products, the easier and faster reactions will run. If this condition exists, we say that the reaction is kinetically favored. Temperature is critical in kinetics as much as it is in thermodynamics. An increase in temperature always helps a reaction go faster since you're now providing more energy to the system to get over the reaction barrier. When reactants run over the activation barrier to form products, we have to consider that the products that form could return over the energy barrier to reform the reactants. And just as in the forward process, the back reaction rate will depend on how high the barrier will be. If the reaction and product activation barriers are somewhat comparable, at equilibrium you would probably find considerable amounts of both reactants and products in the final state. So let's look at some reaction diagrams and see if we can predict what will happen in these processes. We want to discuss both the thermodynamics and kinetics and reason out how these properties work together to direct the process. 
we will assume that we are starting the process with only reactants in each case. The first diagram is reminiscent of the hydrogen-oxygen explosion. The reaction is strongly exothermic, but the barrier is significantly high enough that the reaction might not run until it gets some help via a spark of energy or a catalyst. The back reaction probably won't occur because of the huge barrier between the products and reactants. So once this reaction gets going, it will probably run to completion towards products. The second diagram is like the first, except the barrier is very small. More than likely, this reaction will happen quickly and spontaneously at moderate temperatures. These temperatures should provide more than enough energy to get over the barrier. Now, because the energy barrier for the back reaction is still large, there will be little chance for the back reaction to occur. So we expect this reaction to happen quickly, exothermically, and to completion towards products with very little reactant at equilibrium. The third diagram describes an endothermic reaction with a huge barrier. As in any large barrier reactions, if the reaction runs at all, it will be extremely slow. Once the product forms, there is substantial barrier to the back reaction, so the products are relatively stable too. More than likely, an equilibrium will be established over time where there will be mostly reactants present and maybe a bit of product in the final state. The fourth diagram is also endothermic, but the back reaction barrier is so low that any products that form will more than likely go back to reactants. This reaction probably will not run well, and very little, if any, product will form. The fifth, and actually a very common reaction type, is pictured next. The energies of the reactants and products are similar, and the barrier is moderate and roughly the same height for both the forward and back reactions. After a time, we probably can expect, at equilibrium, a final state of the system having considerable amounts of reactants and products present. The speed at which this equilibrium condition is achieved will depend on the barrier height, and as for all reactions, the smaller the barrier, the faster the system finds equilibrium. One last thing to consider in kinetics is the importance of the concentrations of the reactants and products in determining the result of the reaction. A reaction can only occur if the reactants find each other in a collision. So, it makes sense that the reaction rate depends on the frequency of the collisions and will be dependent on the concentration of the reactants in the reaction vessel. If there is an increase in the concentrations, there will be an increase in the rate of the reaction. Once the collision occurs, does it have enough energy in the collision and have the right orientation to get over the energy barrier? Well, you first have to have the collision before we can answer that question. It becomes a probability game. The more collisions we have, the greater the probability we have of finding collisions with enough energy to get over the energy barrier to form reactants. You can see again why temperature increases always the speed of reactions. Temperature not only provides more energy to the collisions due to the increase in the kinetic energy of the particles, so they have more violent collisions, but temperature also is helping increase the rate of collisions when it speeds up the particles. In summary, we see that a process's likely outcome will depend on both the thermodynamic and kinetic factors. For a reaction to run to completion from reactants to products promptly, the reaction must be thermodynamically favorable first, or it will never run, and kinetically favorable, or it will never run fast enough. That should do it. Catch you later.